It seems to me that the most essential thing of all is the thing that we ignore so often the most, and that is loving, caring, growing human relationships. His name is Leo Biscaglia. He's an educator, an author, and a lecturer, and his favorite topic is love. This is something that is really an integral part of my life. I try to live it and study it and understand it every single day. Very few people seriously study love, and those who do are fascinated by it. Because here is this great, powerful force, but it can't be bought, it can't be demanded, it can't be commanded, it can't be expected, it can't be limited, it can't be possessed, it can't be restricted, it can't be taken from you, and it's tax-free. They come by the thousands to see him, hear him, touch him, and they love him. I walk up to people like this, I say, come on in, and they do, and I'm happy they do. Stand like this and see if they come in. Better yet, stand like this. His advice to everyone is to live life to the fullest each and every day. People say, act your age. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> they say, when you're old, you've got to give things up. I think you become old because you do give things up. Don't give up anything. My epitaph, I don't know about yours, but if you want to fun, write yourself an epitaph. My epitaph says, here lies Felice Leonardo Buscaglia, who lived himself to death. His message is love, and while he forces it on no one, it's there for the taking. Love is essential, but in order to have it, you've got to choose it, you've got to select it, and you know we can. It's amazing. You can, this evening, decide that you are going to dedicate your life to the process of being a lover. And when you walk out, you can start living it. Just who is this messenger of love? What motivates him? Where is he going from here? Do his words make people love each other more, or do they just love him more? This is Don Ray inviting you to listen in on an informal conversation with Leo Biscaglia. If anyone ever bothers to listen, uh, they hear in everything I've ever said, in everything I've ever written, that if you follow me, it's going to lead you to me and you'll get lost because I'm the best me. There is no other Felice Leonardo Buscagli, and if you try to be Felice, you're going to get lost, uh, you're, you're, you're not going to find yourself. Uh, every message that I give is that my major hope is to free you to become you, because you see, when you become you, then I become richer. But if you mimic me, I've already heard what I have to say. Uh, I don't need any more of that, but I do need your world. I need your warmth. I need your understanding. I need your beauty. And that's true of everybody. I do not collect anything. I object to collecting things, and I will never collect people. And when people write me a letter and say, I am a fan of yours, I immediately answer and say, don't be my fan, be my friend. I can deal with friends because friends will forgive me and understand me and be warm toward me, but a fan has expectations and I cannot meet expectations. And if the day ever came that I collected groupies, I'd run to a mountaintop in Nepal and disappear forever. I have no desire to take away people's individuality uh, or their minds. I'm here to liberate, to free, to say, become all that you are because only then can I become richer and can the world profit by who you are. Uh, I think I myself respond negatively to people who have enormous followings uh, because I'm suspicious that they want to take me away from me. And it's only when I find out that they're there to do what the educator is always there to do, and that is to help you to bring you out, uh, then I'm interested in what they have to say. But if they want me to pattern myself after them, I go the opposite direction as quickly as I could walk. 5,000 people watching you. Uh, enormous amount of responsibility, th those people. Uh, sure it is. You're and sending that's them why off with, with who knows what's on their mind when they go there if, if you haven't completely communicated. But you see, that's the beautiful thing. Um, uh, my idea is that uh, as an educator, which is what I am, you know, I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm an educator. I have ideas, and my process is that love is learned, uh, joy of life is learned, all of these things are available to all of us. Anything that is learned can be unlearned and relearned at any time in your life. So what I do is I stand before an audience and I share ideas, 
And I, have, I know as an educator that whether they accept the ideas or reject the ideas, once an idea is put in their mind, their minds become bigger, and then there's no way in which they can shrink again. So it doesn't matter to me whether they agree with me or disagree with me. It delights me that 5,000 people could give up an evening to come and share with me. But I have nothing to sell. I'm not a merchant. I, I'm an educator, and I lay out ideas. And my only hope is that they've picked up an idea or two or three, which has expanded their minds, made them more. They can disagree. You see, it doesn't matter. But once something is planted, your mind gets bigger, and it can't go back again to its normal state. So that's the whole idea of education. You set out the seeds, and only they can pick up the ones they want to nurture and watch them grow. I'm interested in how you got where you are today uh, philosophically. I'm not sure where I am today. <laughs> You'll have to explain where, where I am today. Well, I, in other words, at some point in your life, you did make a conscious decision to, to spread or encourage love. Uh, and you talk about your childhood. All of us mm -hmm. seem to know about your childhood. and. Uh, did, were you aware as a child or as an adolescent? I don't think there was a, a, a violent moment, for instance, that caused me to change. I think I grew up in an atmosphere of warmth and love and tenderness and risk. Uh, my parents, uh, you know, as you know, were uh, Italian immigrants, and, and they were very simple folks, and we were very poor. The difference is, is I didn't know that we were poor. I, I thought we were, we were just as wealthy as everybody else. We used to do wonderful things that other people didn't do. Here we were probably the poorest in the neighborhood, but there was more song in my home than in any other home. There was more food. You know, we had pastas coming out of our ears. Our neighbors used to come in to eat at our house because they had the rich ones, the hamburgers and the hot dogs, and we had the prosciutto and the, the pasta. Mm. And, and uh, so I, I didn't... Uh, I had this all of my life as I grew. Uh, I just became aware, if, if there was a transition, that everybody didn't have it. And then I felt sad because I thought that is available to everybody. It doesn't take money. It doesn't take power. It doesn't take all those crazy things that we think are essential. It takes a decision, and the decision is made in your mind, and that doesn't cost anything. If you decide today that you're going to choose happiness, as naive as this may sound, to you or to the audience listening to us, you can select happiness. But if you want to select despair, that's available too. And it's sad to me that so many people selected despair. So I thought maybe I should go out and remind them that life is a choice. Uh, and if they want to accept it, great. And if they don't, that's okay too. I mean, I don't get paid by the person, you know? So uh, uh, it, it didn't, you know, it, there wasn't a great, like I didn't go to a mountaintop in Nepal and gain enlightenment. Uh, I've always lived with people and in life. And uh, people imagine that I've never suffered, that I've never cried. Well, that's an illusion. I'm still suffering, I'm still crying, I'm still confused, I still don't have all the answers. I still don't know why. The difference is, is that I have chosen to stop asking the questions and to live into the answers. And you know, amazingly enough, they answer themselves. Tell me how that works. You just live. Instead of, of hesitating to live, you live. You, you respond to everything. You keep yourself open. You listen. You take risks. You make choices. And then you hold only yourself responsible for those choices. You know, I'm convinced that the real adult is the person that evaluates very carefully, makes a choice, dives into that choice with all their body and soul. And then if it turns out to be wrong, they don't blame society, they don't blame their mate, they don't blame their family, they don't blame God, for goodness sakes. They blame themselves. They say, I made the wrong choice, but life isn't over. There are other choices to be made. And therein lies the wonder, when you recognize that life is really a series of choices at all times, and that you have the power to select those choices. When That's you come, the wonder. When you come across defeat, though, Obviously, you people do, and we have sadness, and we have of despair, course, and, and we have I depression. have them, too. How do you express it, though? We don't see that. Well, I, I'm one, as you know, I'm a great expe expressor of emotions. I let people know what I feel. And that's wonderful, because don't you realize that when you do that, uh, you're, you're giving somebody something, and that is a knowledge of yourself. Uh, so many people feel that they must keep all of this stuff inside, and therefore the people around them uh, don't know that they're feeling those things. Well, how are we supposed to adequately respond to you if you won't show me who you are? 
And so I, I lay myself out wherever I am. If I'm tired, I say to the people, I'm tired. I don't pretend I'm not. Uh, if I need to be someplace else, I tell people I need to be someplace else. Uh, rather than stay there and be antsy and not listen to what they're saying, which is an insult. Mm -hmm. And so when people are with me, they know that I'm totally there. And that's the greatest gift that I can give someone, to give them all of me and hope that they're doing the same. If it isn't so, letting them know why. I'm not reticent to say to somebody when they say, how are you? I'll say, I'm ill, if I am. Most people think, well, they don't care. I mean, well, then why do they ask me? So they'll say, I'm fine, you know, you're dying of pneumonia. But you say, I'm fine, and you go on your merry way. Well, it, it may be that some are listening, and it, they'll be able to help you. How are they going to know unless you show them? I'm all for being expressive. That's why I'm this way all the time. Well, a lot of people feel that they love, and they indeed do love. And part of that love, it seems, is, uh, is caring about the emotions and the feelings of the other person. And, and for, because of that love, they hold back the things that need to be said uh, uh, the feelings. Uh, what do you say to people? But that's like dishonest. That? Uh, you know, I'm afraid that many of us feel that honesty is cruelty. To me, honesty is the least cruel thing. If there's something wrong with me that you feel, and I want a relationship with you, you must tell me, and you can tell me in a way that isn't cruel. But if we're going to be living in deception all the time, and you're going to constantly be telling me how wonderful I am when you don't truly believe that, how shall I ever grow? What do you do when you come across someone who, who has a brick wall around them? I tell them what is essential for me in terms of the fact that if they want to build a relationship with me and I'm willing to do it, then one of the basis of the relationships must be honesty. We must be honest with each other. Never cruel, but honest. And there's a difference. Uh, viciousness is something that you is destructive always, but, but kindness in the terms of letting us know how you perceive situations and things. I mean, if you were to hurt me, I wouldn't walk away saying, what a horrible person. I would allow you to explain yourself by saying to you, what you just said really hurt me. Then you have an opportunity to explain it. Otherwise, I would say, I'm never gonna see him again. Why should I bother? He's insulting. And, and you maybe didn't even know that you insulted. So this is a wonderful way in which we can build love together, and that is through the process of honesty and revealing what we feel. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say when I'm hugging 2,000 or 3,000 people, when someone comes to me and says, oh, you poor thing, you must be tired, I say, you bet. I don't fantasize that they see me as a superman. I, I don't want to say to them, oh, no, I'm not tired. I say, I'm tired. And I say, let's hang loose because I don't know how I'm going to be feeling. And then we'll make our decisions from there. And when you do that and you're honest with people, they have a deeper respect for you than the games we're constantly playing. Obviously, you can't eliminate emotions from your life. I don't no matter want how much to. you love. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I live on emotions. Of course. Is there something, is there, a, I don't want to be as trivial as saying a pet peeve, but. Are there things that really bring anger out in you? I, 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 am, I still have to deal with the fact that I am a very impatient person. That doesn't mean that I'm cruel, but it means that I, there's never time enough. Uh, for instance, when I came here, I had a suitcase full of invitations from beautiful people to meet their grandparents, to sit down to a bowl of soup, uh, to hug the twins. Somebody last night gave me a little note, put it in my pocket, please come over and meet our triplets. You know, I'd love to do that, but time is just an incredible thing that I have not yet uh, fully learned to cope with. The limitations put upon me by my getting tired and by time, and I know I must accept these things, they're a reality, but uh, those are the things that make me feel impatient. I think, uh, Leo, you must go see those triplets. Those parents are so proud, and you must tell them how wonderful it is that they feel that love for their children. Uh, somebody says, come over and meet my grandmother, she's dying. Uh, I want to meet that grandmother who is dying, but I also feel tired, I also feel uh, that I have uh, my own personal needs. Trying to bridge those gaps in terms of, of uh, physical, mental, psychological demands, and this crazy nebulous thing called time of day, 
or time of life is still a big problem with me. So that and sounds it's something like, I have to deal with. Sounds like with. frustration there. Uh, getting um, back to anger, though. Uh, obviously. Do I get angry? What makes you angry? What makes it's so funny that I can't think of anything that makes me angry except maybe uh, this frustration leads to anger. It's probably what I, brought it on in the first place. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I don't really waste any time uh, with anger. I try to deal with situations that would normally produce anger right on the spot and deal with it. Um, if somebody is rude, I say, you know, why did you do that? Uh, rather than scream and yell at them, I think there must be a reason. And, and so often, it's true there is. Um, today, says this agent at the desk uh, for one of the airlines, I've had a terrible, terrible day. They had to cancel three flights, and people have been screaming at me all day. And uh, therefore, I didn't realize I was being rude. There's always a reason. And, uh, and I need to get the reason. Once I have the reason, the anger is not necessary anymore. The, the, you have quite a personal load you put on yourself at times like this when you're, when you're visiting with people and giving lectures and talks. Uh, it has to be physically and mentally hard on you. Uh, how do you prepare for it? How do you psych yourself up if that's what you do? Well, uh, to psych myself up, I feel a tremendous sense of responsibility. I, I think of, of uh, my own life space, and I think that when I go to a, a lecture or when I uh, go to hear take a class or whatever that it means time and energy on my part I've got to go home I get home late I've got to gobble down dinner in a hurry get in a car drive across town to some auditorium get into traffic jam go in and sit down therefore I have a great respect for the audience and a great feeling of responsibility for them you know these people could have been doing 500 other things they've selected to come and hear me therefore I have got to give them the best that I have and so I, I, I try really hard, I get really into it, because I realize that that's quality time, because we may not have that opportunity again. And so I do the best I can. That's the best that I can do. You're going to be probably hugging maybe 10,000 people here on this trip to Phoenix. Physically, that's got to be tough on you. Uh, yes, can you give everyone that, that hug that they deserve? Or that you well, I don't know I can, if I can give them a hug that they deserve. They probably deserve much more than what I can mm -hmm. give them. But I give them all that I can. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the feeling is that, you know, every, every hug is a different kind of a hug. Um, no two people hug alike. There are some people who come to me and hug me who have never hugged anyone before. There are some, last night, for instance, I hugged several people who said, um, this is the first hug I've had in a long, long time. And it's sad because uh, to have to come to me for that hug where uh, there are so many people in the environment also hungry for hugs seems to me rather sad. I think I will have achieved the highest level of which I'm capable when after a lecture, instead of everybody rushing down to hug me, they would stand up and hug each other. And then I could just smile and leave. But I haven't reached that point. Somehow or other, I, that message is not getting across. And people still feel more secure getting in a line and hugging me than hugging each other. Now, a few people get the message. But uh, that doesn't disappoint me. It's all right. Uh, when they're ready to extend to the person next to them, they will, with or without me. Uh, that many people hugging you with crowds of people around you, in, for brief moments in your week or your month, you you become uh, the focus of all the attention. I'd really like to know what people, some of the things that people say to you, whisper in your ear, when they finally get that chance to hug you. Uh, mostly it's a, it's a very human response. Um, thank you, um, I love you, please keep this up. Um, some things you've said have helped me. Um, that was a good book you wrote. Um, someday, uh, can we have some time together? That's all. Uh, People make very few demands. Uh, I, I'm very lucky, you see, in, a, in, a, in the same sense as some of the artists that go around. I'm not an artist and I'm not a celebrity. Uh, to the audience, I'm a human being like themselves, talking about the things that they know and they feel and they understand. Nothing that I have ever said is original. 
nothing. And that doesn't shame me because what I think I'm saying deserves to be repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, people come to me and say, you know, what you're talking about is in the Bible. I say, I know it. Buddhists come to me when I was traveling through Asia and say, you're speaking the words of Buddha. I say, I know it. Uh, nothing that I say is original, but it's something that we have to be reminded of all the time. What, uh, what do you see as your goal as far as could be that, that you want everyone to share what they've learned from you with someone else, or it could be that, that you have uh, a goal of, of so many people uh, reaching some uh, level of, of loveness in their life? Oh, no, this is expectations. I have no goals. Absolutely none. Um, my goal is to, to talk with you right now. Mm -hmm. And then when we're done, my goal is to find a place to eat lunch. And then my goal is to uh, call people this afternoon and tell them thank you for inviting me to these marvelous things that I haven't time to go, but I appreciate it. And my goal is tonight to give the best possible uh, expression of, of love to this audience as possible. And then my goal will be to go back and go to sleep. Um, I've learned that, that goals are fantasies. They're fun to think about, uh, but they can also lead you away from what is reality, which is, as I spoke about before, the moment. So uh, I have no goal about what I... I have no expectations of my audiences. You have no expectations They're free. and no goals. What about simple direction? Do you have a direction you're going? Uh, yes, there is definitely direction. That is to become all that I am. Uh, I'm really enchanted by the fact that there are no limitations to us, that we can continue to become forever and ever and ever. And that's very exciting to me, and that's what I try to give my students and my audiences, a knowledge that uh, what you don't know about yourself and about love can't be used for your own growth. And therefore, your responsibility is to learn all that you possibly can, both about you, about your environment, about nature. Uh, I am a great learner. And if you want me to stay in your life space, teach me. That's the essence. So if I have any direction, my direction is to become all that I am. And maybe to help you to realize that your greatest value comes from discovering all that you are. That's all. Many of the people feel that, that they know you as a close friend. And you must have people uh, recognizing you occasionally in grocery stores or, or wherever. Sure. Uh, and uh, it would be uh, naive of me to think that that you didn't have some type of a definition between your public life and your personal life. How do you cope with it? Um, well, it's all my life. <laughs> That's the first thing. And uh, everything I have, I've welcomed. Uh, so it's, it's fun to meet total strangers who come to you and say, uh, I know you. And the wonderful part about it is that it's not the it's not the groupy kind generally. It's the very warm and gentle kind that talk to you, that hug you, uh, that say it's so nice to meet you. My wife will never believe it, or my husband will never believe it, or my family will never believe it, and then they leave you alone. Uh, it isn't that they don't make demands. They're they're beautiful, tender people, and so I can handle that. Uh, but there's also a segment of my life that is a very private part. And I hold that very dear. Um, I don't share it with many people. Uh, those people with whom I do, uh, they're very deep and meaningful relationships that are growing and causing me to grow. And I look forward to them. I would like to be able to love all people all over the world with equal intensity. And I know that I could, uh, but time doesn't permit it again. You need a close cluster of friends, loved ones, family. And I'm very close to these people. I mean a, a great deal to them, and they mean a great deal to me. And as I grow, I can bring more to them. And uh, they understand me really well and accept me really well. I mean, they make very few demands. But when they do, I'm there to fulfill them. I have a box of Band-Aids for them, and they have one for me. And uh, it's that wonderful core and nucleus that gives me the strength and the energy uh, and the desire from there to branch out and share with others so that it's possible for me to hug 5,000 people and then go home and, and feel the warmth and tenderness of a few. 
Uh, but that is something that I don't want interfered with. Uh, that is my private life. And I think all of us need that. Um, we can't become public. We can't become totally public. If we do, uh, there's nothing that's uniquely ours. Uh, and, I, and if the people in my life do not desire to be made public, they should have that fulfilled. So there will always be a part of me uh, that will be ours in terms of a very close. But there's so much available of me that is available for public. And that's all right, too. But I would hope that people, uh, whoever they are, would have an aspect of themselves that they would hold private and dear and not broadcast, uh, hold holy, uh, and say, I don't need to share that. There's enough of me that is shareable, and I can keep that and that aspect for those unique few. Uh, that's very important to me. It always will be. And if the public life bursts in there and destroys that holy sanctuary that's totally mine, then I might have to consider giving up the public life. But I don't see where that's going to be. It's going to be up to me to keep it private. You quoted the, the character of the fox yes. in uh, the book The Little Prince last night. Yes. Uh, one of the other things that he says in the book is that when you tame someone, you're responsible for them. That's right. How are you responsible to people? Um, I, I don't know that uh, in the fox's definition of taming that I tame people. Um, I love people and uh, they can rest assured that I will continue to love them. If they make mistakes, uh, if they fall on their faces, uh, whatever, uh, my love has no restrictions. Uh, but I, to say that I think those people that are close to me, there is time to tame. You remember that the fox says, taming takes time, and it's a ritual. It grows. You come to see me each day, each day and we will come closer and we'll play together and we'll learn about each other. And that's how those very deep, meaningful relationships occur. The fox also has a lot of other people in his environment besides the little, fo the little prince, but he takes time to tame the little prince. Well, when you're coming into a city like Phoenix for two days and there are uh, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people wanting to see you. There isn't time to tame 10,000 people, but you can tell those people about taming and they can find their little groups to tame.